All right. Well, it's uh, it's the hour. We are at the top of the hour now. We appreciate everybody joining. Um, hopefully everybody got a chance to go through chapter one and some of the work that we did last week. Um, I, I made it through most of it, um, but I'm looking forward to to covering what Colin or have Colin cover what he's prepared for us tonight. Um, before I forget, we uh, we want to line up a couple of people for upcoming weeks as well. Um, and I looked on the GitHub and well, so at the end of last week, I signed up for week four, August 18th, uh, but I didn't see that reflected on um, on the readme which probably means I did something wrong. Um, but then I also saw that uh, in the Slack, I think Ola mentioned that she would pick up next week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. So do I need, so is there anything that we need to do right now to update the readme so that the presenters are reflecting correctly on that? I can make those changes, Ryan. I think you might be looking at the one that's not forked um, yeah. or you might be looking at the original RFDS and we haven't talked about pull requests. And so okay. you, you might not have to do a pull request before it gets integrated into the R for DS, but yeah. I could show you how to do that um, outside. Cause we won't get to that tonight, okay. Cool. but I can, I can update for week four and then Ola for next week. And then we can go from there. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then with that, let me just turn it over to you then, Colin, take it away. Sure. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, welcome to I'm gonna go desktop three. So everybody can see my screen, correct? Okay. Just want to make sure. So um, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into chapter number one. Uh, I'm going to quick go and kind of show you a quick workflow that I didn't complete last time, looking at some like terminal commands to kind of do the Git workflow that we were talking about. Uh, so, but before we do that, we got a couple minutes. Um, we usually do a five minute icebreaker. So really, really quick, uh, if people want to share, my five minute icebreaker is, are you an outdoor person or an indoor person? Um, currently it is about 98, 99 degrees here in Lincoln. So today I'm an indoor person but I'm usually an indoor person. So uh, anybody else want to share? Same. It's too, it's too hot to go outside. Um, but I like being indoors as well. Um, like reading a book and drinking hot cocoa. How many of those books in your background, Ola, have you read? Oh, uh, this is a Zoom background. This is fake. <laughs> Hmm. Great. Who else? Does anybody else want to share? Indoor, outdoor person? Oh, I'm an indoor person for sure. I don't like when there is too much green. And I live uh, in a small city. I can go next. I'm definitely an outdoor person. Uh, I've, I've been known to uh, throw the laptop and uh, hotspot in my backpack and, and go uh, for a walk. Um, Colin, you're familiar with the area that, that we live in, but uh, uh, where I live at in Southwest Lincoln, uh, it's about a 10-mile hike from my doorstep to Holmes Lake and then back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I've made that uh, trek quite a few times. It's nice to, to see the scenery. Uh, the heat doesn't really bother me too much as long as it's in the shade. It's, it's when the sun's beating on you that that hiking can, can really be a problem. Great. Excellent. I know the area. <laughs> I've been to Holmes, definitely. Anybody else? And again, you don't have to share if you don't want to, but. I was say I'm in central Florida where it's always hot, but I still like being, getting outside for a walk throughout the day. So despite it is, we're in the midst of, it's end of July and we got about maybe until October to where it gets reasonable. <laughs> so it's just brutally hot all the time. I think it's uh, uh, with uh, Ryan and yourself. I think it's like 250 percent humidity in your in your areas, right? Houston and, and Central Florida. That's right. I I try to make a point of getting outside every day, but ever since uh, I started working from home, I've gotten to the I've gotten to like 
eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night and realized that I haven't stepped outside the door. And so I have been known to just open the front door, step out onto the porch, breathe some fresh air and then go to bed. Uh, and, but uh, hopefully that doesn't last too much longer. We can all get back out into the world. Excellent. Uh, does anybody else want to share? Yeah, I've, uh, I enjoyed hiking. I, I got into bird watching over, over the pandemic. Spent some, spent some, uh, about too much money on some Sony camera gear. So now I can take photos that are, you know, of questionable quality, but they're better than I was doing. So that's super cool. Excellent. Anybody else? I don't, I don't know if, if anybody else wants to share. I don't know who else is on the call. Eileen? And again, you don't have to share if you're if you don't want to. That's that's okay too. Um, you're on mute, Eileen. Actually, I'm on mute. So sorry about that. <laughs> I was speaking away. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't decide whether I'm outdoor or indoor. I'm actually kind of both. So uh, uh, I love being indoors. Though I can be indoors for probably weeks, and I didn't realize it um, if I'm you know zoned into something. Um, but I also like I also have dogs, so. You know, the dog park is always the, uh, the place to go or to a park or to hike. We have a great arboretum here in Ottawa. Um, that's really, you know, it's just, I can't believe it's free. You know, it's just so nice. And it, you could take your dogs and just walk for, for quite a while. So it's kind of nice. Excellent. It's great to hear, especially when you ask some, you know, people that usually spend most of their day on their computer, you indoor outdoor person. And it's great to hear that there's a wide range because sometimes you get some groups that say, oh, we're just indoor people. So it's good to hear that there are people that enjoy the outdoors a little bit and the indoors as well. So tonight, what we're going to do is, oh, some quick housekeeping reminders. Um, we talked about these last times, you know, video cameras optional, but encouraged. Um, I kind of want to highlight this one again. Uh, if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. Uh, you know, most likely if you have a question, somebody probably has the same question. Also, the other thing that I want to highlight is, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and levels of experience. So if you have some input or you have a question or anything, you know, feel free to jump in. I mean, it's, we're an open group here. We're all learning. So if, if you have some experience in something, more than happy for you to jump in and, and kind of uh, ha have a discussion rather than just one person kind of talking the whole time. And again, discussion is one of those ways that we all learn. So if you, you know, if you have something to say or you have a question or you want to interject something, feel free to because this is an open group to do so. Uh, take some time to learn the theory. Uh, please attempt to do the chapter exercises. And then also please plan on teaching one of the lessons. Um, I know some people have already kind of jumped in to do it, but teaching is one of the best ways to learn. At least that's the way I kind of view it is teach. If you could teach somebody to do it, then you know it pretty well. So hopefully I can teach you something today so that I can show that I know a few things at least decently well, a little bit. So, um, Tonight's discussion, we're going to finish up the chapter 00, zero um, up and running with Git and GitHub. Um, I'm just going to quick demo the pull, commit, and push workflow from the terminal. I'm maybe going to spend maybe like five, 10 minutes on it. Um, I'm not really going to spend too much more time than that. I was also thinking about putting a couple of videos together to kind of run down kind of that workflow using the GUI and the terminal, because I think it's something that you just got to see somebody do over and over again to really get it instead of just seeing it one time. But I'll kind of quick run over just that, and then we'll kind of jump into chapter one tonight, talking about um, our first Shiny app, talking about simple Shiny apps, starting and stopping, uh, discuss the differences between the UI and server elements, and then introduce the concept of reactivity and the use of reactive expressions inside of the server function. And so we'll kind of spend our time doing that tonight. Next week, which we've already discussed, I think Ola said she'll take chapter number two. So um, we really appreciate you doing that. And so kind of a looking forward after tonight. So let's kind of just jump right in here real quick. And, and this was the discussion that we were having last time. And this was a diagram that I shared with you. I'm not gonna kind of go over each piece of this diagram, but you can kind of look through it. But this is kind of the basic workflow of a, um, a Git pull, make changes on your computer, and then uh, git add, git commit, git push with some other different commands that you could do to get some information on your different commits that you are your different types of files that you wanna commit and track changes for. 
And so what I'm going to kind of do is I walked through the GUI last time and, and hopefully some people got some use out of that one. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to kind of go over this workflow in the terminal. Now, I'm going to go over some commands that we've talked about, and I'm not going to go step by step into each one of these commands, but you'll kind of hear these commands as I walk through them as kind of like I would use in the terminal uh, in our studio. But I've kind of in the notes listed out some common commands that you're going to see or hear that are included in this workflow. And so and some of them, there's a little bit different flavors. There's different options that you can use with each one of these. So um, I'm not going to cover all those options. There's just not enough time for me to do that. And some of these may be different based on how your computer is set up. For me, um, one of the big differences is my text editor that I have is, is Vim. So I use Vim, but your computer might be defaulting to a different text editor. Uh, if that conversation is something that's you know beyond what you know right now, don't worry. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. And if you come across differences, then you know we can kind of sit and discuss outside of this. But really, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull over my R Studio. I'm going to do everything in the terminal here in the integrated terminal in R Studio. This may be different because I set up my R Studio a lot different. Um, this pane is generally on the bottom left, but I change it to go to the top right. But usually there's the terminal is right next to the console. And so you can click terminal here. And this gives you access to pretty much your, uh, gives you access to use Git to perform this workflow. Now for people that are on Mac, you know, I usually use a Mac terminal. Uh, Windows people, I know some people in the chat last time said that there are terminals available for Windows. I'm just not really familiar with them. So I don't really, I, I'm not the right person to ask that question, but there are people here who, who are a little bit more familiar with Windows and could probably help you with that. So um, reach out to them and, and discuss that. But really what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk through this basic workflow of just a, a pull, you know, track my changes, make a couple changes, and then do a, a git add, git commit, and then a git push. And so usually the first thing that I do is when I'm in the terminal and the terminal prompt, I'm just going to do a quick kind of git branch. I'm just going to kind of look at what branch am I currently on. Uh, this is just getting some information. We didn't talk too much about branching, but the way to kind of think of it is it's like a separate version of, of code that you're working on. And as we work through this kind of, as we kind of work through this, uh, as a book club, we'll, we'll get to branching, but it's always good to kind of make sure what branch are you on. The next thing that I'll usually do is I'll do a git pull just to make sure that I have everything that's up in the repo down or everything that's up in the repo is pulled down into my computer. And so I'm making sure everything's updated because if you're collaborating with people and they're adding stuff to the source code base, you want to make sure that you do a git pull to make sure that you have everything down. Now, once I do a git pull, what I'll usually do is I'll do like a git status. A git status is one of those commands that kind of gives you information on what you've changed in comparison to what was in the repo up above. And so what you can see here with my book club M shiny, I have several changes that have been modified and that are on track. Now, what I need to do is I need to quickly stage these and then once I stage them, then I can add my comment and then I can push it. And so what I'm gonna do here is how you add it is you can use this command called git add. Now there's multiple ways to add files. I'm gonna cover two ways that I think are, are um, two ways that I usually do it. Now you can add all of your changes using a dash A or a dot. Now I kind of got slapped on the slapped on the hand when I started doing this um, was doing like a git add all or a git add dash a because some people say be deliberate in what you're adding. And so I've kind of changed my workflow to not do this because you may accidentally add something that you don't want into the repo if you just do a git add all. So I was somebody that was doing that. Somebody slapped me on the wrist and was like, don't do this anymore. And so now I'm more deliberate. And what I do is I actually add the file name. So if I want to track these files right here, what I can do is I can add it. Um, and you can use shorthand to do a tab out. You know, you can put the tab name and then add it. It's going to be added. And so it's staged and it's ready to add a commit to it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick get status. And you'll see the difference now between my prompts before. 
before I didn't have anything added or staged. Now, because I did that git add and I added this file, I have it right here and it's saying, this will, be this will be added to my commit once I make my commit. Now there's another way, say you have a bunch of files. I love the interactive version of the git add. I don't know, this, are people familiar with the, the interactive version of the git add? Oh, I, this, like, this changed my workflow when I, when I learned how to do this. So when you do, if you have like a bunch of files, if you do git add dash I, it will open an interactive prompt that you can work through to like make changes and add files. So right now it's telling me these things are on staged. What I do is I just select a specific command like add on tracked. It will show me all the files that are on, are on be, not being tracked. I can do a shorthand where it's like, hey, I only wanna track one through 14. It says a one through 14 are tracked, hit enter. And then once I do that, I can just jump out of it and quit out of it. So I love the interactive version of this. If you're somebody who has a lot of files that you have to like add to your commits, saves a lot of time. So, but all I have to do is just do Q or quit, hit enter, and it takes me out. And so I'm outside of the interactive kind of Git version. So I, I interactive shell is slam dunk. I love it. If, if you're somebody who has a lot of files to change, you know, just use that Git add dash I, okay. So now I have those, I have a git status, seeing what I'm gonna add. These are all the files that I'm gonna kind of state or that are staged for commit. Once I do this, I could do git commit. Um, there's two ways to do this. You could do it a short way by adding a git dash M to add a short message to your commit. Um, this is okay if it's just a minor change, um, but if you have like a lot of changes that you need to track and add more information, I suggest doing the git commit, not shorthand. Okay, so if you do just git commit, what it will do is it will open up a text editor. And again, this is where at the start I said, hey, this may be different based on your computer and what's set up. Mine took me into Vim. Yours may take you into a different text editor. Again, if this is something that you're not familiar with, that's okay. You know, come, you know, come talk to me or talk to somebody who's more familiar with Windows or um, more familiar with text editors and we can kind of explain it. But this is where I add my kind of commit message. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna add, and I already messed it up, but um, Vim is kind of finicky. It's kind of particular, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add my commit message, added, added new content. And if I wanted to, I can add more information underneath all of this stuff in my commit message. And you can be as detailed as you want. I'm not gonna get into, last time I said, I'm not gonna get into more information about you know, what you want to add in here, but just to keep it simple, I'm just going to say added new content. How I escape out of this is I just hit escape, hit colon X, and there it is, get status. Now you can see all of my stuff moved out of it. And pretty much the only thing that isn't tracked yet is this other file. So question, have I pushed this to the repo yet? with the commands that I've run, would it be changed in GitHub? No, it wouldn't. So I have to do a git push. And so if I do a git push, the git push is what is actually taking it, my local changes with that commit message and it's pushing it up to the main branch on GitHub. And so you're just gonna have to trust me cause I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna jump over to GitHub here but those files should now be tracked with my commit message that I've had, okay? Now I know that was like, warp speed git, but um, that's kind of the general workflow of a git pull, make some changes, git add, git commit, git push um, using the terminal here in our studio. Does anybody have any questions or what questions can I answer about kind of this workflow? Yeah, Colin, I have a question. Um, sure. There is, a, uh, do you have um, git uh, integrated with your um, R studio? Because I, because I was just committing, um, you know, our homework, and it was really kind of easy. It was just, I just pushed it, but <laughs> I just, it just seemed like it was just commit and push, or you know, using a commit message. It was pretty. It was like a visual. I don't know. 
That's a good question. Um, I think as long as you have Git on your system, and, and somebody else might be able to answer this better than me, as long as you have Git on your system, our studio should be able to find where Git is located and it should be automatically integrated. But I'm treading lightly there because I'm not 100% sure. So if anybody wants to jump in, you know, please do. I, ju I just know that I have some issue with the CCH key, stuff like that. So because I'm using sometimes a Mac, sometimes a window, not, not exactly the same computer. And I had some kind of issue, now it's solved, but uh, you have to do some kind of config and put the SSH. Uh, it is with, everything is expanded on Google. Yeah, so there, and, and I think the problem that you're having, Sandra, is that it's the connection between your local computer and GitHub. Because is it, is it an error that comes up when you do like a Git push? Yeah, so it's an issue with your connection between your local computer and GitHub. And so maybe that's something that, you know, we'll need to sit down and kind of talk one on one with, um, because that's like, it will be like your one computer to kind of figure out how to best do that. That probably wasn't the best answer, but that's what I got right now. <laughs> well, and I'll, if you don't mind, I'll extend just sure. one more moment uh, uh, with Sandra's question. So the team, if, if you haven't set up that that security certificate or that token uh, uh, with your uh, local machine and and registered with GitHub. It will give you that error. It's a security flaw. Well, it's a security error. So it's saying I don't recognize your computer. I'm not going to trust you. Therefore, I'm not going to let you allow you to push. Creating that SSH key is is fairly simple, um, and I'd be more than willing to to extend out uh, as as Colin had mentioned. Um, to, uh, to talk about that subject as well. Yeah, right. Ryan's the best. Like, right. When I wrote Ryan, um, Ryan's the best to talk to because he helped the other Ryan. And I was like, yeah, you're getting into stuff I don't know. <laughs> well, and, and to, to extend the earlier comment, calling your, your, your statement or, or, uh, uh Eileen's question, uh, regarding the, uh, the path. Uh, yes, technically our studio supports Git. Uh, it's, it's part of the entire ecosystem of, of version control, et cetera. Um, being able to establish it in your path variable, and that's regardless of the operating system you're on, Mac, Linux, or Windows, that same path variable must be updated so that our studio knows where to execute or access the, the library that's, that's the Git language uh, to uh, package, uh, package it and send it. Excellent. So does anybody have any other questions or comments? Um, again, um, what I'm going to do is my hope is because there's just not enough time to go over this in the time that we have. I think I'm going to put a couple videos together to put with the materials that kind of like go step by step and are maybe a little bit more clear than my warp speed version of Git. But hopefully this introduced you to some interesting other tools or, or just the workflow so you can kind of familiarize yourself with it. But yeah. What, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but to find the active version of um, Git for um, for our studio, you can you can type in which Git and then I'll give you the path name and then you go into your preferences and then put it there. Oh, that makes sense. Yes. And again, there's a lot of different commands that, you know, and sometimes I've just set it up and ran with it and it works. So and that's probably a slap on the wrist, but um... There's probably a better way to do it. So um, again, you know, reach out in the Slack because again, you know, personal computers and setting that up, that's just not my forte, but there are people here in this group that are more than willing to help. So um, excellent questions. Uh, so let's just kind of jump on. Uh, I'm That's the demo that I have. I have some other resources that are available to you. I've linked them in here. Uh, I have some really good ones that I've kind of come across. I won't cover all of these, but there's this Git branching game that I've linked. I think this is something that I've used a little bit. It's kind of an interactive game that will give you um, shell commands that you can use. And it's basically where it's just kind of teaching you how to use Git and it kind of walks you through how to use it. And it talks about branching. It gets into some more advanced stuff, but um, it's definitely something to look at. And it's, you know, it's a game. So it makes it a little bit more fun than just, you know, you doing it on your own projects and then being worrying that you're going to screw something up. But uh, I link this in the materials for you and you can kind of access this if you are interested. There's also a couple other ones here that kind of get in more depth and at Tan, he's in the Slack. He's put together a couple videos that are, they're a little bit more in depth and, and um, 
uh, they're really good. They're about 15 to 20 minutes in length, but they're, um, they kind of cover some more, more detail about how to kind of use Git and stuff. So excellent. Well, let's kind of jump over here and talk about uh, the first chapter. Uh, what's really nice, and this is kind of a, a selling point for using these materials that are available in the R4DS repo is, is that the intention of these review materials for the Mastering Shiny were to be used for these sessions. So you don't have to go and you know reinvent the wheel of creating content. So uh, I found this very useful for me because I just basically was able to use this material on R4DS and then just kind of expand on it or take things away for our specific session. So if you're kind of worried about like, well, I don't want to start from ground zero to do a session, the previous cohort put this together for us to use. And it's a great kind of resource to, you know, kind of expand on and use for the session. So um, if you're somebody who's like, I want to present, but I don't want to start from ground zero, here you go. This is perfect. So let's kind of talk a little bit about um, your first kind of shiny app. And so what we're going to do is this base, this chapter is kind of talking about like the minimum that you need for a shiny app. And really what it's interested in talking about is talking about two different elements, the UI and the server. And when it really comes down to a shiny app, that's really what you need to have to have a shiny app and have it to work. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a shiny app here. No, oh, that's not the one that I want. Up and shiny. Let me go to my examples. Excuse me while I pull up my examples. I had these up earlier. Examples. Examples. Chapter one. So when we look at this, when it comes down to a shiny app, all we need is really two different elements. We need the UI and we need the server. And so here's my question to you. Is this a shiny app? Will this run? What do you think? Do you think this will run? Do you think it won't run? Yeah. Okay. So Connor says it will run. And he is correct. This Shiny app is actually running. And so I can share it with you here when it gives me the actual output. Now, it's not a very useful Shiny app. It doesn't provide any value to us um, outside of it. But really, it is a blank Shiny app. It is actually running. And the reason it's running is because we have the two elements that are, are needed for a Shiny app. We have the UI, which is defined by this fluid page function. And then we have the server function. And you know we obviously have the library Shiny, but then we also have the Shiny app call to put the UI and the server together. So this is a true running Shiny app. So one, one, go one ahead. Question. question. So um, typically when you do assignments or you, you pick whatever name you want, like, you know, my variable or, you know, function name, and then you assign values to that. But in this case, it always has to be UI and server. That is correct. And you know, what's nice about this is, is that there is actually a shorthand to put this skeleton together. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I remember reading about the snippets. There's a snippet for it. Yep. And so there's an actual snippet together and it will actually put the snippet for you. So if you go shiny and you see the shiny app and you tab yeah. it out, it gives you the skeleton for a true running shiny app. And so, you know, again, and, and, and sorry if I cut you off there, Ryan, but really what you're doing here is that's all you really need for a, a, a valid running shiny app is just the UI and the server function together. And that's all you need. Cool. So with that, what we're really kind of interested in is it, it, it also talks about reactive programming. And if you watch any of the materials, uh, if you watch any like kind of the shiny podcast or you listen to some of those, which I highly, highly suggest that you do if you're kind of interested in using shiny, is a lot of the time people talk about their biggest constraint of learning shiny is learning reactive programming. Now, we're only going to touch upon it a little bit today when we talk about uh, like reactive expressions. But really, um, this is kind of a pain point for people, but it's something that's going to be discussed. But really, what it is, is it's, it's talking about shiny outputs can be using shiny expressions. What we can do is we can use, uh, we can get shiny outputs that automatically re react based on user input. Now, you got to keep that distinction different between what is the user. The user is the person that's actually using your app. 
So people that are actually clicking the buttons and providing the information so that they can get whatever output is going to happen. And so here's just kind of a basic diagram of this is that there's a user input and then the UI actually changes. So what the user actually sees changes based on what the user provides for your specific app. So the book also talks about some version stuff. You can dig more into this. Many of you should be familiar with how to install packages, but uh, the book suggests that you go above 1.5 or higher. The current version on CRAN right now is 1.6. So if you do check your version, um, the latest is 1.6 is the most stable version. So. so let's talk a little bit more about creating the app. So the first thing that the book kind of talks about is setting up the UI and some UI elements. And so the book kind of first talks about just putting in just this string value of hello world. And so if we go back to our basic app and put in hello world, what we have is we now have this UI element that we can look at and you'll see hello world pops up. Okay, now we're going to fill this UI with some more stuff where it provides a little bit more functionality where the user can actually provide some inputs to it um, and kind of interact with the app. And then we'll get into the server, which deals with the actual behavior of your app. So again, when we talk about the UI, it's basically the HTML that gets created. And so there's different functions there out or there's different functions or UI functions that just pump out HTML. And I'll share that with you here in a second. The server function, again, defines the behavior of your app. So what is actually being done based on the types of inputs that are provided. And then the Shiny App UI server just puts everything together and wraps it together. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the basic workflow for Shiny Apps. Uh, this is the one that was discussed in the book. I put together just a basic diagram. It's an iterative process. It's just this development where you write some code, you start the app, you play around and test it, and then you stop the app, and then you keep writing and keep doing that same process over and over again. And if you've ever developed Shiny Apps before, you'll find out that you'll be doing this pattern over and over and over again. Write some code, start the app, play and test around with it, shoot, this doesn't work, or I don't like this, stop it, write some more code and keep doing that same process. Now there's different ways to start the app. You can kind of read more about how to do those. But the first one is you can look on your document, um, excuse me, you can look at your document toolbar and you just have this run app button. Again, it just runs it pretty easy that way, that way. A couple things that you want to notice when you run your application, you're going to notice that uh, you get, and someone might have to help me with this, with this a little bit, but you get your IP address, which refers to your local computer. And then it randomly assigns this specific app to a port number. Now, the way I understand it, and somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, the port is just basically an address to where the application is running. Correct, not correct. Somebody want to I think it's me? telling the browser where to find it at that IP address. So it's like, it's like the apartment number, right? It's it's the address and then then which apartment is it? Yeah, that's what that's what that's a good way to put yeah, that's an excellent way to put it. Um is just like, hey, it's um this IP address is saying my local computer and then go to this specific location on my computer, like a specific apartment building apartment, you know, so, um, but anybody else have any input on that? Well, then I can add or, or maybe Ola, I think you may be able to probably add your, your input as well. Uh, the, the web server itself or the, the, the port identification is, is where the daemon is located or where the service is running on the CPU. So when that, that, that port call is made, it's, it's, it's to that service uh, in your in your computer, uh, in this case, it's just the local host. One twenty seven zero zero one is a local host. So that port identification is the service. This this shiny web server that is running in the background. Um, it may be an arbitrary number. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think you can you can call it out uh, in your code uh, to assign it if if you need to. Um, Another good way of, of kind of understanding this port assignment concept, uh, if you do an ARP or a, I think it's netstat, I think it's a netstat command, 
um, on a computer, it will it'll spit out all of your active ports. So these are all of your active services on that uh, uh, computer. And this could be anything. It, it's your SMTP, your email addressing, your, your uh, uh, web services, any of the pages that you have open, et cetera. Does that answer your question or extend? That's oh yeah, no, that, that extends it. So it's just for my understanding, it's like the physical location on your CPU, right? Or the physical connection on your CPU. It's yeah, it's it's kind of, it, it's not directly tied to the process ID, but it's similar in nature from a web inter or from a networking interface. Uh, port identifications are are part of the the uh, the network uh, uh, infrastructure. Great. Uh, yeah, that clears that up for me. And what's nice about this and to take this to like a kind of a practical discussion is, is now because I'm running this in like a, a menu that's popped outside of Shiny or outside of our studio, I could take this and I could put this into my browser and my browser can find that specific location of where the Shiny web server is actually running. And so here's my app running in the browser. Hello world. And so and, and that's pretty much how, like when, whenever our studio sends out like a specific, and, and I'm saying this in kind of general terms, but anytime like our studio has like a process that's sent out to the browser, it uses that IP kind of port number thing to kind of push that application out. Um, thanks for that. Cause again, port numbers and stuff networking, that's, that's beyond me. <laughs> um, so, What's also kind of nice about this is that you can also start your application, you know, via a terminal if you wanted to. And I was going to share it, but I, I think just for the sake of time, I'm not going to. If you're interested, let me know. But what you can actually do, and I thought this was kind of neat, was, and, and again, this is, and it, oh, the other thing that I want to say is, is that if you're running an app, it, it, it stops your console. So you're not able to enter any commands until you stop the web server. And that was one of the first things that when I came across doing Shiny, I was like, why can't I type commands? Why can't I type commands? It's because the process, the, the process of the application running is taking up your console. And so you have to stop it. And so you can stop it here, hitting the stop sign up in the top right. Or you can use a, a hotkey, which is control C, and it actually stops the actual process. But if you wanted to, what you could do is you could go to your terminal, run an R session, and you could basically source your application file and you could actually run it from here and run it on the terminal if you wanted to or if you had a terminal that you're running on your computer here as well you could source it here and run it and that's what i've done here before as i ran it this application here and actually i might be able to do it because i have the history here so if i source it because right now i'm in an r session in a terminal i'm running it and it runs it in my browser for me so if you don't want to run it in our studio you can run it in a terminal and push it to your browser. Um, so that's stopping the app. We kind of covered that a little bit. Let's start adding the UI controls. Uh, really the big thing about the UI controls that you want to know is these are functions that output HTML. That's their main, that's their purpose really. Um, and what they do is they're creating basically the HTML for inputs or outputs. So things that the user selects to kind of change the behavior of the application or the different outputs of what gets outputted so that, that the user can actually see. And so the book kind of talks about layout functions, input controls, and output controls. So fluid page is a function that kind of sets up the general layout of your application. And then the actual input controls are different variations of different types of inputs that your user can actually use. But the big thing to kind of know is all these really do is they just pump out HTML. That's, that's what they do. And so if we put this into our application that we have that we're putting together here, bear with me here for a second, because I got a bunch of windows open here. Uh, if we put this into our application, and we take out our hello world, put this in here, and we actually run this app. And I'm gonna run it in my browser. If I look at this, if I do, and nothing's gonna pop up because I haven't defined the server logic yet, but if I do like a right click inspect elements, you could start seeing the HTML that gets pop, that gets out, that gets outputted from those specific functions. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the inspect elements any a little bit or any more today, but this is a good tool to kind of view the HTML that's getting pushed out if you wanna see it in the browser. Another thing that you can do as well is inside of your console, 
is you can actually run the output function. You can actually run the input function itself. So this select input, what we can do is we can copy it and take it over to our console in our studio and run it. Oh, I, oh, I got to do library shiny. Library shiny, and I'm in the wrong one here. So library shiny. If I run this, you can see all of the HTML that gets outputted from that specific function. And so again, thinking about any of those, those UI functions, their main purpose is to you know, do the HTML for the actual user interface. Uh, what questions does anybody have about those UI controls, inputs, outputs, or layout functions? And I'm not monitoring the chat, so. Anybody have any questions? No. Cool. All right. Hopefully I'm being clear and it's more, more me being, doing a good job than, um, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Sure. So where, if I wanted to do like a calendar input, uh, do you know like where I can find like more documentations for different inputs and outputs? Yeah, there is, um, there is, at least there used to be one. Yeah, right here. So um, one of the lessons for Shiny, it will kind of talk about the different different widgets that you can use. Actually, you know what, a calendar, if I remember right, I think it might be an additional, it might be another package that you might have to use, but does anybody have any input? It, it had it on the key. Did, yeah, I think it's date input. Yeah, date range. Yeah, yeah, date input. But if you haven't seen, our studio has a lot of like. If you go to the shiny one and you go to the different like lessons, like to get started, they have like all the different control widgets that are specific that are just for like the from like the base kind of shiny package. There's a ton of extensions that people have written that do a lot of different widgets. But I mean, pretty much the the ones that you can think of, like off the top of your head, they're probably already available. And so I'll link this in the, um, I'll link these in the notes. Did that answer your question, Ola? Yeah, that answered my question. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so the other thing is, is, you know, with the layout functions, you don't have to just use fluid page. There's many different variations. One of them, if you're interested in having more of a kind of a separate navigation rather than some type of dashboard, you can use this layout function called nav bar page. And here's an example of the nav bar page. And I actually got to run it. I got to refresh it here. But here's an example of a different type of layout function rather than just using fluid page. So it's going to take a second, but um, it should load, hopefully. Waiting for gallery. What other questions can I answer for anybody while this kind of example loads? If you can tell me how to pad the top bar on nav bar, on the nav bar page. Like I've tried different CSS options, so it doesn't like doesn't crowd the top of it. I cannot figure it out. Does anybody have any input? Because that one, yeah, CSS and stuff. I'm beyond that. Connor, uh, I think what. Uh, oh, sorry. Forgive me. No, I I. No, that's okay. I I don't have like an exact answer. All I know is like. I think the shiny CSS is like based off of uh, Bootstrap um, CSS, mm -hmm. and so uh, I know it's like kind of difficult to like edit the CSS with that. I don't. Do you have like an exact answer, Ryan, with that? Well, where I was going to go with the subject is is normally uh, you can make inline calls uh, to a a particular HTML text. So uh, uh, I think it's. Uh, Sorry, Connor. Uh, Connor, your your comment. If you go to that particular, like that inspect F12, will will open up your browser inspect, highlight that uh, cell that say nav bar, for example. You can see what portion of code that you're reflecting on. Normally, if in that DevOps uh, uh, mode of of browser uh, support, you can start to add your inline uh, uh, padding. I, it's not a recommended practice. The, the better option would be what Olo was referring to, that bootstrap CSS. That actually changes that div tag or that, that particular call of, of uh, 
what is that? It's the Darwin architecture, the, the tag itself. If it's a P tag, if it's a script tag, if it's a XYZ, you know, whatever tag, by modifying the CSS, you're doing that globally across all of your output. Um, so it really depends on, on what it is you're trying to achieve. I would say for a testing purposes or just trying to get some uh, familiarity with what the HTML is doing, the browser is doing, uh, adding that uh, uh, padding left, padding right uh, uh, into your uh, inline uh, code will create that uh, a necessity that you're looking for. Excellent. And, and I'll um, check that out. Oh. So, and then to, you know, for people, for, for anybody that's not familiar, you know, with CSS or HTML, basically um, CSS, from my understanding, again, I'm not a developer or a front end developer is just kind of like the, the, how it looks. So different, like different code that you can write for how it looks. And we'll get to kind of more of that extension stuff as we get further on in the book too, as well. Um, but here's an example of a nav bar um, using within Shiny. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this view, but basically the nav bar just allows you to add basically navigation to your application. And so this is an example of, of the nav bar kind of layout function. So that's adding UI elements. Let's talk a little bit about adding behavior. So um, what we need to know with adding behavior that happens in the server function. And basically the server function is what gives life to our application. And this is where we kind of get introduced to the idea of reactive programming. And really what we need to know is reactive programming tells Shiny how to perform a function. Now, to put this into more simple terms, the book uses this quote, it's the difference between giving someone a recipe versus demanding that they go and, and make you a sandwich. Now, from the way I understand it from that way is I kind of put this into my own words. Somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like you're coding the range of app behaviors. So the things the app can actually do inside the server, but then the user who actually uses your app demands the output based on their specific inputs. So I don't know if that, that kind of made sense in my head thinking about it. Um, but that's just kind of, the mental model I have. It's basically like in the server, you're setting up the different range of behaviors that your application can do. And what actually gets outputted is based on the specific inputs that your user of your app uses. And that might be as clear as mud if anybody wants to add any input to that. So when we talk about this with the server function, it really tells us how in, in our application, I'm going to put this into our application. It basically tells our application what we want to do. And in our case, what we want to do is we want to output a summary and we want to output a table. And so I'm going to go back to our application here. I'm going to add this code into it. And I'm going to, I'm just going to reload the application. Now, basically what we're saying is, okay, the user is going to input a specific data set that it wants run. And since we have that, we want to output two different objects to the UI. We want to output a summary and we want to output the table of that specific data set. And so if our user goes through and they changes it, basically, or changes their input or wants to look at a different type of data set, it's going to be able to change um, it's going to be able to change because we've defined that specific behavior in the server function. And so we're saying, hey, the user itself is going to provide us this object called data set and data set is going to dictate what actually gets outputted in the specific UI. And that's where we define it here. Now, when it comes to different server functions, what you're going to get is a lot of render functions. So a render something. And in our case, we're going to get render print or render table. And in our case, render print is just printing out text. And then uh, render table is outputting table. Now, for us to actually output that into the UI, we have to use two separate functions to define our UI, to define the HTML. In our case, we're using verbatim text output, summary, so summary here, and then table output table for output table. Um, one thing that kind of tripped me up when I first started doing Shiny and the, 
the shiny apps that I put together was anytime that you have uh, UI out, or UI inputs and different outputs, just make sure you put a comma. I, I, I first thought like my first thought was just, oh, you just keep adding them in there and they'll work and then error, error, error. And so this was like a simple mistake that I learned that, oh, you got to add a comma, you know, for any time you add like a layer to your specific application. So for any shiny beginners out there, hopefully it's a, hopefully that's a bridge that you can cross quickly. <laughs> uh, so yeah. We're not actually, so server is a function here, but we're not actually calling this uh, uh, server function anywhere I, that I see in UI. Is that just happened automatically? Is that part of the, like part of the deal? Oh, it's down there. Yeah, so I'll, uh, um, yeah, it's right here basically. So what's gonna happen is, is that when we run this application or reload it, it will run Shiny App UI server together. It oh. will run the server code and then it will run the UI elements. Gotcha. Because, and, and that kind of tripped me up too when I first started thinking about it, because when you first, when your user first starts the application or if the application starts, for the server function to actually work, it has to take this first value and then render it first because your user is technically not providing you any input just yet. Me as user, I haven't provided you any input. So it first kind of takes that, those values first, renders them, and then outputs the specific HTML, and then puts that into the UI. Then once the user uses it, then it goes from there. Did that kind of clear that up? Okay, great. Um, I, I have one question. Sure. Uh, uh, is it okay if I annotate? Sure. Yeah, go for it. All right. So in order for the, the server, like the, the server is like the back end and it controls the behavior of the app. And so in order to connect the back end with the front end, we always have to have these little IDs, like you were saying, like summary and table. And so that's how the the front end, the UI knows, hey, you know, draw this on the on the front end, right? Or yeah, I think you're spot on. I, I think it's it's basically it's an object, right? Like it's an object in the environment. And so like the server function is actually creating an object in the environment. And someone please correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know the total internals, but it's like it's creating an object in the environment. In our case, we're saying, hey, in the output environment, we have this thing called summary. Well, we want to create the HTML for that summary object. So we pass it into this function verbatim text output. So the only way that we, that this function knows what to output, we have to give it the summary object name, but somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. That's the way I understand it. So when you get into this, into the server function portion, you'll have an output and then the dollar sign summary and the reason that you can put summary there is because you've already named summary up above with an output function. So like line five has something, something output, and then you give it the name summary. And so now when you get down into the server portion, you can do output dollar sign summary. And I, I, on, line, on line six, you have something, something output and then table, and that's why down in line 15, you can do output dollar sign table. Is that right? Ryan, you wanna jump in? No, I was gonna say, I think Ryan, you're stating it correctly, but I think we need to invert how that uh, instantiation is being made. I believe the, the, the variable of server is the code base, right? And then in the UI, you're calling that variable back in to, uh, uh, stitch it together or, or create it. So your, your, your statement is correct, only inverse. So okay. your your server is actually what's instantiating the variable. You're calling on that variable in your UI. Got it. So then yeah. that, that means, that, okay, so, okay, I see. So in the function, one of the arguments is output. Uh, one, so you have function input output mm -hmm. and on line nine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, I think you got it right. Yeah, because you have input output session. Yeah. So the way the way I've I have this thing in my head from like a 
like something that I read one time, it's, a, it's to think of it like the server is going to run first. Yeah. The server runs first, and this is where your objects get defined. And then for you to actually output those objects is within your actual UI. And then you have to call those functions in there. But that's that's just me vaguely remembering something that I read was somebody's like, hey, the server gets run first. That's where the objects get defined. You just call those objects up into the UI. I think the so, server runs first unless there's reactivity where the server is taking an input. Yeah, and that's gonna <laughs> that's a good segue where we're going next. Um, but I got about five minutes left and um, I got about five minutes left and unfortunately I have another call here at seven so I won't be able to finish this but that would be a great place for us to pick up with reactive uh, expressions and we'll probably only spend about 10 to 15 minutes on that so I think Ola should be able to um, jump in with chapter two so I don't think this puts us off schedule by any means but let's kind of table the reactive expressions discussion for next time. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, can I ask one more question about the, the code that you've got? Sure. Go sure. Uh, so you have output summary in line 10. Um, rend, uh, render print. Okay. So you just, I see. So that was just, uh, that was just, just, that was just determined to be called summary, but it could have been called um, output call, uh, dollar sign um I don't know, response or it could have been whatever you wanted right there yeah yeah pretty much i mean what you can think of it is like it's kind of like a list right yeah like output is like a, a container is like a container yeah. and you have this object summary okay. that's the mental model i have right now but it, and you know okay and, and the other thing that i'm making connection on right now is that typically what i've seen what i've been doing in in, in past like particularly with wrangling in the tiny verse you already have the data and so you might have like data frame and then one of the columns is id and so then you can put data you know then you can put df dollar sign id um but but i haven't done too much of creating a new column by naming it and then assigning a value to it which it's dawning on me now that's what you're doing here you you have a, an output object the dollar sign summary creates the new column i don't know what it's supposed to be called but it's like the, a new uh element of the output object and that's being assigned to or the renter print and all that is being assigned to the new column so you're creating a new a new portion of the output object called summary and then another one called table they get that right if i explained it okay yeah i i well i i think um, and again, I'm, I'm being a little short and someone can expand on this once I jump off the call here in a minute. Um, it's, it's think of it like a list. You're adding extra items to the yeah. list is the way I would think of it, but it's not necessarily an object. It's a recipe. It's telling you how to do it. Yeah. So, and that's, that's going to be a hard distinction to kind of figure out. It's not just a, an object. It's, it's an actual way to do something. It's instructions that you're giving the application how to run. Makes sense. And so I, I kind of realize there's a little bit of a, it's kind of confusing because the output summary, the summary data sets another function on the data set. So that's a little confusing. Yeah. That's a confusing example. Oh yeah, that's a good point. That's true. I took this example from the book. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pull, so, uh, pull, pull request. Just, pull just, request. Yeah. <laughs> Tweet. It stuck yeah. out to me right there. I'm like, that's kind of confusing for someone. It's, it's a, it's the name of the object yeah. and the function. Tweet Hadley <laughs> about that one. <laughs> excellent, po excellent, excellent pull request. Great contribution. <laughs> um, if it's okay, Colin, maybe we can't end it there because we do want to be consistent about ending on time. Um, and we've got maybe just a few seconds left. So um, unless anybody objects, maybe we can we can leave it there and then pick up where we left off next week Does that yeah. sound okay to everybody sorry i have to kind of run but i have another call at seven so yeah, no problem well let's leave it there um we can meet up again in the chat and continue on either in the chat uh, in the slack or in next week does that work yep and then if anybody wants to zoom like have other questions that we talked about and have a zoom later on like later in the week or something more than happy to do that um, i'm just kind of short changed right now with with time so sounds good 
Thank you, Colin, for your time. Thanks, everybody, for your time and, and for the, uh, the investment. We will talk to you guys next time. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.